You're watching Keystone Science. And in today's episode, we're going to show you how to make your very own FM radio. So before we begin, let me quickly tell you guys why I didn't make a video last week. Quite frankly, that mainly had to do with three reasons. First off, I had to accept colleges. Second off, I have AP tests around this time. And third, the project that I was planning on filming last week when I tried filming it actually kind of didn't work that well. And so I think what had happened is that when I began soldering it, it fried the delicate transistors that were needed for the project. And so yeah, with that said, today's project is going to be this very simple FM radio. Here's the circuit that we'll be using. Now this is probably the simplest circuit that I've ever come across for an FM receiver, so let's go ahead and build it out. To build out this circuit, we're going to be using a breadboard like this. The first thing we can add to our circuit will be this 22,000 ohm resistor. Now I don't have a resistor that equals a perfect 22,000 ohms. However, I do have a 20,000 ohm resistor and a 2,000 ohm resistor. And so by adding these in series one to another, it should equal out to the 22,000 ohms. And so we can go ahead and connect up those series of resistors from the positive rail over to here. Now as we can see, that 22,000 ohm resistor is going to be connected up to the base of this transistor, as well as these components over here. And so first, let's focus in on these two components here. In order to make this coil, I'm going to take a small strand of 26 gauge magnet wire, and I'm going to tightly wind it four times around the screwdriver. Now we simply need to take some sandpaper and sand off the coating on the wire. And then after sliding it off of the screwdriver, our simple inductor coil is complete. Now going back to our circuit, we need to connect the coil to an open rail and to our resistors. The next thing we need is a 22 picofarad variable capacitor. These can come in a variety of looks, but on the cheaper end, mine looks like this. As you can see on the inside, there's a place to turn it. What's happening is that when we turn it on the inside, two pieces of metal are becoming more and more parallel to each other. And this in turn increases the capacitance. But then when we turn it the other way, the surface area of the metal becomes less and less parallel to one another, thus decreasing the capacitance. And so we just need to insert that parallel to the coil. Next, we're going to use some of these 2N3904 transistors. As you can see using my transistor tester, the pinout for them from left to right goes collector, base, emitter. And so that means when the transistor is oriented like this, it goes collector, base, emitter. And on our circuit diagram, this part's the collector, this is the base, and this is the emitter. And so as you can see on our circuit, the collector and base are going to be in parallel with the capacitor and inductor. And so in order to do that, I'll just flip around my transistor to then connect the collector here, the base here, and the emitter on an open rail. And as you can see, the emitter of the transistor is then connected up to the ground rail. And so we'll just take that and bring it over to this negative rail over here. For the next transistor, we can see that the collector needs to be connected up to the base of the last one, and the base of this transistor needs to be connected up to the 22,000 ohm resistor. And so let's put that into our breadboard. First, I'm just going to insert this transistor right here. And so we can take a wire from the collector of this transistor to the base of the last, and then a wire from the base to the collector and 22,000 ohm resistor of the last one, and then one final wire from the emitter to the ground rail. For this 22 microfarad capacitor, I have this one that I'll be using. Now obviously this capacitor is a bit bulky for what we're doing, but it should work fine anyway, so I'm going to use it. And so that capacitor needs to be connected from the base to an open rail. And so I'm just going to connect it to that base and string it across to this rail over here. And the other end of that capacitor is going to be connected up to a potentiometer. A potentiometer is a variable resistor, so basically by turning the dial we can change the resistance. As you can see it has three pins. The middle pin on this circuit is going to be this arrow, while the other two are just the other ends. And so we can input it so that one end of the potentiometer is connected up to that other end of that capacitor. And then the other leg of the potentiometer that isn't the middle one will need to be connected up to the ground rail. Next I'll be using one of these LM386 op amps. As you can see I have the different pins labeled here such as 3, 2, 6, 5, and 4. If you don't know how to read the pinout, basically just orient the divot facing upwards and then we have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, and 8. And so in order to isolate all the pins from each other, we need to insert the op amp in the middle of the board like this. Now we can run a wire from that center pin of that potentiometer to pin 3 of the op amp. And then pin 2 needs to be connected to ground, and pin 4 can be connected up to pin 2. And then we can take a wire from pin 6 going over to the positive rail. And then pin 5 needs a little bit more circuitry. And so we can start by taking a 0.1 microfarad capacitor such as this, and connect it in between the negative rail and pin 5. Now we can take a 220 microfarad capacitor, and connect the positive end to pin 5 and the negative end to an open rail. And now we can connect one end of a speaker to that open rail, and the other end to the negative rail. And then finally we can take a wire to use as the antenna, and we can connect it up to the circuit. And as you can see, that antenna is going to be connected up to that other end of the 22,000 ohm resistor. And just like that, our FM radio should be complete. To test it, I'm going to be connecting up the positive and negative ends of my power supply to those positive and negative rails. Here's the power supply that I'll be using. If you don't have one like this, you can just use a battery, adding up to around 3.5 volts is where I found it works best. Okay, so let's go ahead and turn up the voltage and see if we can hear anything. 
Okay, I can hear a slight static coming out of this. Let's go ahead and turn this potentiometer, which is our volume knob, and see if we can hear any voices. Although very quiet, I can actually hear some voices coming through on that speaker, so we know that it is working. In order to get rid of that static sound, I'm going to add a capacitor right here. By adding a capacitor like this, which I'm going to use around a 470 microfarad capacitor, it should be able to filter out some of the noises that's coming from the power supply. And so I'm just going to take that capacitor and insert the negative end into the negative rail and the positive end into the positive rail. And just like that, a lot of our noise should be taken care of, so let's go ahead and power it back up and see if we can hear it better. Now after adding in that filter capacitor and changing to a speaker with a higher impedance, you can hear as I turn up the volume we get voices. And so I'll cut that off fast because I'm not sure exactly which radio station that is. Now just for fun, since I'm not quite sure which station we're tuned to, we can calculate out exactly which station we're tuned to by using a little bit of math. Now the frequency that we're turned to is due to an oscillation between these two parts here. Basically what will happen is that the capacitor will build up a charge, then dump its charge into this coil. And then this coil will build up a magnetic field, and then when it collapses back in, it'll dump that turned back into the capacitor. And so basically, by the inductance here and the capacitance here, we can determine out the frequency that it's resonating at. In fact, the resonant frequency is going to be equal to 1 over 2 pi, times the square root of the inductance times the capacitance. Now I had to measure my capacitance in a little bit of a weird way using an oscilloscope, since none of my equipment were sensitive enough besides that to measure that. And so the capacitance that it was set to was around 18 picofarads. Now I could also use my oscilloscope to measure the inductance, however there's a formula that we can use. And so the formula for the inductance of an air core inductor is going to be the inductance is equal to the number of turns squared times the diameter squared, divided by 18 times the diameter plus 40 times the length. And so by putting out this formula, we have 4 turns, so 4 squared times the diameter, which in this case is around 0.25 inches, divided by 18 times the 0.25, plus 40 times the coil length, which in this case is around 0.1 inches. And so after doing the math, this gives us an inductance of 0.117647. And so this means that our inductance is approximately around 0.117 microhenries. This is approximately equal to 1.17 times 10 to the negative 7th. And so going back to our original formula, if we plug this in, we get 1 over 2 pi of 18 picofarads, which in this case is 18 times 10 to the negative 12th, times the inductance, which is 1.17 times 10 to the negative 7th. And so actually, when I was running that test, it wasn't 18 picofarads. My capacitance was at around 22 picofarads. And so running that calculation, that gives us 9.96 times 10 to the 7th. This is equal to 99.6 megahertz. Now granted, it's likely different from this since my measurements of the air coil were not at all exact and mainly estimations. And so due to my non-exactness, I'm going to say plus or minus 10 megahertz. Now obviously, if you're doing this yourself and had something like calipers, you could get a lot more exact of an answer than what I got here. Now just to verify my calculations, I have another radio here. And as you can see, it's playing the exact same frequency that this is playing. And so on the FM range, this was exactly 92 megahertz. And so looking back at our calculations, this is approximately 8 megahertz away from our guess. But once again, I think that's just because I didn't really measure the coil all that accurately, and so that definitely would account for the variation that we saw. So now that we know how to build our own radio, let's understand some of the principles behind what's happening here. In a previous episode, we built an FM transmitter. And so if you haven't yet, you can go ahead and watch that video so you can learn how the transmitter works. However, the receiver practically just works as a mirrored image of the transmitter. And so since this is FM, that stands for frequency modulation. What this means is that from this capacitor inductor oscillator, we're able to set this to a certain frequency. And then once we set it to that frequency, over on the transmitter, that will also be carrying at that same frequency. However, based on the audio going in, it's going to modulate it, making the frequency slightly higher or slightly lower. By modulating that frequency, it's able to take those modulations and then convert it into an audible signal through this amplifier. Now this amplifier is very important because otherwise it would not nearly be loud enough to hear. And in fact, these transistors also sort of act like amplifiers because that much is needed to be able to convert that small, small signal given by the magnetic waves from the antenna. Now this op amp here is amplifying it at around 20 times. However, if you do want it to be louder, you could add a connection from pin 8. And then on that connection, you could add a 10 microfarad capacitor. And the other end of that capacitor would then need to be looped around and connected up to pin 1. And then instead of 20 times amplification, it should be somewhere around 200 times amplification. However, this new setup will draw quite a bit more power. Now I'm not sure exactly how much power it was drawing, but I do know it was less than 10 milliamps, as otherwise it would have shown up on my power supply meter. So yeah, that's the gist of how an FM receiver works. And if you're curious to know how AM works, I have a video showing how to make an AM transmitter. And that video will be linked in the description below. Now of course, I could have turned the variable capacitor there to more fit into the radio frequency that we are listening to. However, in all honesty, I actually can't find a screwdriver that fits inside that capacitor. 
but by turning that tile on the capacitor, you'd be changing the capacitance and thus changing that resonant frequency that we calculated. So now you know how to make a very simple FM receiver and some of the mathematical principles behind it. Thank you all so much for watching the video. If you were able to learn something new in this video, I'd really appreciate it if you'd leave a thumbs up as it really helps the channel by quite a bit. And if you'd like to see science videos like this one, go ahead and hit the subscribe button so it'll show up in your subscription newsfeed. Links going further into depth on principles on how this works will be found in the description below if you want to go read that for yourself. And so guys, please remember to be safe, and have a wonderful day. You're watching Keystone Science, and in today's episode we're going to show you how to turn an old refrigerator into a vacuum pump.